Hello friends, in this uh, lecture we're going to discuss about high flow nasal oxygen therapy. So the nasal oxygen therapy is commonly used uh, in the perioperative period. But this concept of high flow nasal uh, oxygen therapy actually came from uh, infants uh, or neonates. In 2009, uh, Park and his colleagues, they published a paper in uh, British Journal of Anesthesia uh, about uh, nasal high flow therapy uh, in neonates. And they actually concluded that the uh, nasal oxygen therapy in children actually provides positive pressure to the airways. So it was very useful in children or neonates uh, uh, who uh, actually lacked uh, surfactants, so it was used to contract the lack of uh, surfactants in neonates. So what about in adults? When did we start using uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy in the adults? So it was in 2013 when Gautira and colleagues actually published uh, their paper titled Clinical Evidence on High Flow Oxygen Therapy an active humidification in adults, in which they found that just like in neonates, even in adults, uh, it had similar uh, CPAP effect. And that's where the whole trend actually started. So it's not uh, been, uh, you know, for very long uh, since we have been started using the therapy. So uh, the high flow nasal oxygen therapy, uh, nasal system uh, does not use the usual uh, the cannula, uh, nasal cannula, which is a narrow bore, the tubings are narrow, but it uses a special uh, system or a catheter system which has got wide bore prongs and uh, it has got a wider tubing. So the resistance to flow is much lower in this system. So this is one part. The second part of it is actually how it is delivered. So we actually have uh, the flow meters, uh, which obviously has uh, got a blender for oxygen air, and we can deliver oxygen uh, from anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 liters per minute uh, with 100% uh, you know, FiO2. Uh, we can control the FiO2 obviously because it's a oxygen air blender. And then we actually have a warm humidifier uh, this is similar to the one uh, is that is used in the intensive care. And the tubing, associated tubing, which are always, like said, uh, they are wide and they are uh, of, uh, you know, low resistance. And there is actually monitoring system as well, so they can monitor the temperature of the gases which are delivered to the patient. So this is the uh, flow meter uh, used for uh, delivering high flows. And you can uh, see that unlike uh, the normal uh, flow meters, this can deliver flow up to almost 70 liters per minute. The ordinary flow uh, meters will deliver you around 12 to 15 liters per minute. There are many different companies uh, that supply these devices, the whole system. Um, Drager produces them, uh, Peckel. Fisher Paykel actually produces them, and they are OptiFlow. Uh, there are various companies which are producing them. So this is the OptiFlow system, and you can actually see that the inspiratory limb connections are wide in this. These are 15 or 22 millimeters, and they're latex-free. The flow uh, resistance is actually very low. It's around 11.6 centimeters of water as measured in this system. Uh, there are adapters uh, uh, for uh, the nebulizers and aerosol generator adapters. So uh, this is a complete system which comes with these humidifiers, these, uh, uh, you know, the uh, giving pole, <laughs> the uh, uh, with the bags where you, because you need to actually give water, you know, have some saline or water for humidification and uh, you can also actually have uh, additional cylinders as well. So it is a, it is a complete uh, system. Uh, uh, for delivery of high flow oxygen. The good thing about these systems are these for single patient, they can be used for almost 30 days. So we can reduce the cost of care. So what are the physiological basis of the high flow nasal oxygen therapy? So if you look at it, the it is about peak inspiratory flows. Um, in normal individuals and uh, normal breathing, the uh, peak inspiratory flow is around 15 liters per minute. 
But once the patient is distressed, there is a respiratory distress, these flows can go up to, or peak inspiratory flows can go up to 100 to 120 liters per minute. These are actually very, very high. So the oxygen we breathe, or the air we breathe, is warmed and humidified in the upper airways. The uh, evaporation of water from the nasal mucus uh, provides the humidification as well as the uh, warming up. The, there is increased uh, surface area in the nasal turbinates uh, which has got high blood supply. So they actually also provide the heat. So it is heated up to the temperature of 36 degrees and almost 80 to 90 percent is humidified. But if we bypass this by mouth breathing, this humidity is reduced to 70%. But when patients are under uh, distress and using very high flows of 100 to 220 liters per minute, and the amount of uh, the humidification uh, and warming is reduced, and patient can't sustain such high uh, requirements for very long, this is limited by the fatigue and because there is increased, uh, you know, flows and they, which need to be warmed and humidified, there is increased uh, fluid losses and there is also increase in the metabolic oxygen requirements. So when there is increased oxygen requirement in patients and if you are actually supplying cold dry gases, uh, this exacerbates the heat loss and uh, it is uncomfortable for the patient. And if you are actually trying to increase the flow, so normally, like say with nasal cannula, you can actually give comfortable give flows around four to six liters per minute. But if you try to go beyond that, this becomes uh, very uncomfortable for the patient, and they won't tolerate it. And uh, as uh, like I said, uh, you need to uh, uh, you know the nasal mucus uh, humidifies and heats it up, but this efficacy actually goes down. And lots of time you will see that when the patients are actually under, uh, you know, stress or respiratory distress, they will start breathing, you know, bypassing the nasal cavity, they start breathing by mouth. You can actually see the patient say, for example, if you are running, due, you know, exercising, you tend to breathe through mouth. Okay, so they bypass the nasal mucus uh, uh, as well. So there is not much humidity. So this is reduced to almost 50%. And reduction in humidity has got its own uh, associated problems. They can be mucus plugging, which can lead to airway obstruction. And if there is airway obstruction, that I'm not talking about upper airway obstruction, but lower airways, this is usually from mucus plugging. Uh, there is arterial desaturation, and that can lead to respiratory tract infection. Why does this happen? So if you look at the normal uh, tracheal mucosa, uh, we have the sol layer and we have the gel layer, uh, which consists of the uh, mucus layer. Now the ciliary uh, components, uh, you know, the ciliated epithelium, uh, it moves within the sol layer and only it is partially sticking out. And this uh, movement of the cilia is towards the mouth. So all the secretions are expectorated out. They can't go in, right? But when th there is dehydration or there is underhydration of the cell layer, uh, the cilia get entrapped in the mucus layer and they are not able to function efficiently. And this leads to actually retention of the mucus uh, or secretions. Okay. And this leads to further problems. So the physiological effects. Uh, so if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, warm humidified gases, they obviously reduce the uh, your uh, you know uh, surface dehydration uh, because you are supplying uh, the uh, uh, you know warm humidified uh, gases and uh, because there is hydration is maintained so there is improved secretion clearance and hence there is decreased atelectasis there is another cause for decreased atelectasis which will likely uh, come to in a minute so what is the experience with the use of the high uh, flow nasal oxygen therapy in adults? The experience has been actually a wonderful, especially in, in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, early, early acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Patients actually have described it to be very comfortable. Uh, this tolerance is much better than uh, other non-invasive techniques uh, that use masks or use uh, uh, you know helmets 
And they have seen that there is reduction in uh, subjective feeling of dyspnea. They feel they can breathe better. Their respiratory rate actually drops. Yeah, so they're not so tachypneic. And because you're supplying them warm humidified air, they do not feel the dryness that is normally seen with cold, dry air, uh, which is used normally used uh, with the nasal specs. But some patients actually may not actually tolerate this very high flows and very high temperature. They might actually feel this warm air, very uncomfortable. So it's very, very important that when you actually start off therapy, that you do not, the, the patient is already in distress, so you don't want to actually further increase this. So you start it around 25 to 30 liters per minute and keep the temperature on 31 degrees Celsius for the first 15 minutes. Then over the next 30 minutes, you slowly uh, increase the temperature from 34 to 37 degrees Celsius. And then you can actually also increase the flows going up to around 60 liters per minute. But in most cases, you will be able to actually maintain the oxygenation with around 40 liters uh, per minute. And FI2 can be controlled depending on uh, what the patient's uh, requirement, oxygen requirements are. So the high flows uh, up to 60 liters per minute are also shown to effectively wash out carbon dioxide. And this is uh, also uh, leads to reduction in the anatomical dead space. So this anatomical dead space uh, is about uh, 150 ml. This is now filled up with uh, oxygen. So this also acts as a reservoir. And with this high flows, we are able to actually almost deliver FiO2 of 1 uh, uh, in the patients. So it allows us to deliver very high FiO2 unlike in normal uh, nasal catheters. So nasal catheters, they can only deliver uh, uh, you know, gas is up to 15 liters per minute. Um, but like I said, most patients will only comfortably accept flows up to 6 liters. Beyond that, it becomes very turbulent flow. It is at high flow because these catheters are very narrow. And uh, because of that, it is like jet of air going and impinging on the nasal mucosa and causing injury to the mucosa and dryness as well because they're not humidified. So it has been seen that even in calm breathing um, with uh, flows of one to six liters, you can only, there's the FI2 varies between 0 0.26 to 0.54. And with rapid breathing, this can uh, vary between 0.24 to 0.45. So this is very variable. Whereas if you look at the high flow nasal uh, catheters, uh, where you can deliver high FI2, uh, so it's not only they're able to deliver high FI2 up to one, one so 100% oxygen, but it also matches the high inspiratory gas flows that can occur in patients who are very spirit distress. Like I have already mentioned that uh, during the respiratory distress, the peak inspiratory flows can go up to almost 120 liters per minute. And uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, while trying to find out how the FIA2 uh, at the you know, nasal outlet matches with what's set, they have seen that it actually are uh, corresponding very closely. So it can accurately deliver the FI to wh what you set at the machine end. And previously, I mentioned about the washout of carbon dioxide and the so carbon dioxide. There is uh, a reduction in a dead space. Uh, like I said, the dead space is now filled with oxygen. So there is effective washout of carbon dioxide occurring. And you can actually see uh, in this diagram, uh, this I had actually shown in my lecture on oxygen therapy. So when we breathe oxygen, the oxygen passes from, through the gas transport zone, which constitutes the anatomical dead space. So it starts from the upper airway till you reach the respiratory bronchioles. From the respiratory bronchioles onwards, that is a gas exchange zone. So now this uh, yeah, anatomical dead space is now uh, you know, uh, replaced by oxygen. This would normally uh, contain the air we breathe, but now it is actually filled with oxygen. So you have uh, now an atypical oxygen reservoir when you're giving uh, high flows. And it also reduces the work of breathing. And the CPAP effect created by these high flows caused the uh, distending pressure around 33.2 to 7.4 uh, centimeters of water. Uh, with the mild close. So you are actually creating a CPAP system 
uh, because of these high flows. There is also uh, electrical impedance tomographic evidence uh, and this actually shown that is there is increased and expiratory lung volume that means the CPAP has been uh, maintained and there is uh, alveolar recruitment because of this uh, CPAP effect. So if you look at the summary of the effects, <coughs> the high flows, high flows uh, are maintained throughout inspiration and expiration. During inspiration, uh, this uh, causes high FiO2. So this covers the, the increased uh, peak inspiratory flows, uh, uh, which can vary from 15 liters per minute during normal breathing to almost 120 liters per minute during the uh, your uh, you know distress. And there is alveolar recruitment and redistribution of tidal volume. And this is happening because of the creation of a continuous positive pressure. During expiration, there is a peep effect. There is alveolar recruitment. There is washout uh, from the dead space. So your dead space is not filled up with oxygen. So both these things lead to improvement in the PaO2 and also washout of carbon dioxide. Okay. And this too leads to decrease in the work of breathing uh, because there is decrease in the inspiratory efforts. There is a reduction in the respiratory rate, okay, and mild ventilation is also improved. The humidification and heating uh, provides comfort and compliance, and it also leads to a reduction in dehydration of the soil layer. So there is effective mucus clearance, so secretion are not retained, and this also actually provides or helps in reducing the microatelectasis occurring, which can happen because of microplugging. So. All in all, this is a wonderful system to use uh, in a lot of clinical applications. So if we actually look at the indications, uh, obviously it was started in neonates to provide a listening pressure to contract the effects of uh, lack of surfactants. And uh, it is uh, can be used in treatment of acute respiratory failure in adults. It can be used during management of difficult airways. Yeah, it can be used to improve gas exchange uh, following upper abdominal surgeries or cardiac surgery. It can be used uh, uh, post extubation or immediately pre intubation uh, in the intensive care. It can be used to in uh, facilitating uh, bronchoscopy. So we go through this uh, one by one uh, briefly. So acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, there have been uh, trial. There was a flow. Florali uh, trial, F-L-O-R-A-L-I trial, and um, uh, this uh, actually showed uh, that uh, this can reduce the use of uh, uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy can reduce the intubation requirements in patients with known uh, cardiogenic uh, acute respiratory failure uh, in patients who have PA2 by FI2 ratio of less than uh, 200 milliliters of mercury. Uh, but no difference was seen uh, in the intubation rates uh, in patients who had a, a higher PA2 by FI2 ratio. And like we already explained, uh, and the uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy is actually better tolerated uh, by patients. And it actually provides us uh, kind of a peep of around uh, 5 centimeters. And we are providing them warm humidify uh, gases, uh, which uh, are a better, uh, uh, you know, interface uh, for patients than uh, tight fitting masks. Then uh, there obviously are a few setbacks of using uh, high flow na nasal oxygen therapy. Um, that can lead to delay in initiating uh, invasive ventilation. You can think that, oh, I can wait a little bit more. Uh, it is improving. Okay, so inappropriate perseverance uh, with uh, this therapy uh, can uh, lead to increased IC mortality and worsen outcomes. So you need to know when to at least say, no, this is enough, is enough. We need to uh, move on. Okay. So what about in uh, use for airway management? So high flow nasal oxygen therapy can be used in management of emergency and uh, elective airway management uh, to provide pre-oxygenation or denitrogenation of the lungs. And uh, like I say, it is provides oxygen reservoir uh, during apnea, uh, which is, these are the core principles of uh, airway management in uh, any any case anyway. So basically, it is increasing the viable apneic window uh, uh, for us. Okay, uh, so it's making it uh, safe. And um, 
you know, some of the uh, uh, special group of patients, especially like obstetrics, uh, bariatrics, septic patients, and, and these are these are potential uh, group of patients where high flow uh, nasal oxygen therapy before intubation actually might uh, provide us a, a safety window for us. Uh, then uh, also in certain cases, um, like in post exhibition or post operative uh, use, and say for example, you have major abdominal surgery or cardiac surgery uh, patient. Uh, these patients, actually, there is some amount of atelectasis happening, and uh, there is alteration in the respiratory mechanisms secondary to pain. And uh, so, if you have taken care of the pain and you're taken care of other aspects, then providing nasal uh, oxygen therapy, uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy. Uh, can help in uh, reducing the post-operative hypoxemia or atelectasis okay, without actually uh, having to, you know, put them on uh, tight-fitting uh, face mask for providing CPAP. So they just require a little bit of extra support, and this is uh, this is in addition to providing good analgesia uh, for the patients. And this has been seen in the OPERA trial, where uh, this is uh, OptiFlow for prevention of post-operative extubation hypoxemia after abdominal surgery. Okay, so this re reduces the requirement for uh, actual non-invasive ventilation or uh, tracheal intubation, uh, slightly better than uh, them. And uh, so this leads to reduction in the post-operative pulmonary uh, complications. Um, other groups, it has been used uh, for uh, uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, so it can provide uh, oxygenation during uh, uh, bronchoscopy and especially in critical care uh, where we're doing uh, uh, you know uh, bronchoscopy in relatively hypoxemic patients or even for patients who actually uh, you know have undergo uh, rigid bronchoscopy uh, for uh, diagnostic purposes again uh, providing uh, uh, the uh, high flow nasal oxygenation will maintain uh, the saturation in these patients or so reduce the desaturation uh, in them uh, before I move to contraindication, this is also probably useful in palliative care as well, cancer patients, uh, you know, so to alleviate the respiratory distress symptoms of cancer patients, uh, reduce the respiratory rate. Uh, maybe also useful in uh, long-term uh, patients, well, in uh, patients who are on long-term oxygen therapy and, and COPD. It can obviously use as a treatment for exacerbation. Um, where uh, probably non-invasive therapy using BiPAP would be a better option. Uh, but it has been seen that it can actually reduce the frequency of exacerbation in the COPD patients. So uh, that's probably another group of patients. Contraindications for high flow nasal oxygen therapy is probably similar to uh, any non-invasive ventilation, which is provided using a face mask or a hood or a, uh, you know, the helmet. So this should not actually use of uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy should not delay tracheal intubation. So you need to be careful, uh, you know, that you do not persevere with this therapy, and uh, you do not use this in patients who have reduced level of consciousness or patients who are uncooperative. Um, Epistaxis is probably more of a contraindication in patients uh, uh, where you want to use the traditional nasal cannulas. Uh, but high flow oxygen can actually affect uh, the mucosa and cause, uh, because of direct pressure effect, so it can cause epistaxis. Facial injuries you will obviously avoid. Area obstruction is, does not make any sense in any kind of the non-invasive therapy, so you need to look for the cause of area obstruction. And any uh, contraindication for applying PEEP also applies to this. So for example, if you actually have patients uh, where they call, they're going to be cardio uh, respiratory instability, cardiovascular instability uh, with increase in PEEP, then you may not want to actually use that. So there are very few indications, uh, the contraindications exactly that way. So this uh, brings us to the end of the lecture. And uh, thank you for listening to this lecture. And I hope this is useful uh, for you all.